It's good to see everybody. Welcome to everybody on site. Welcome to everybody online watching and worshiping with us as well. My name is Jacob Young. I'm the lead pastor here at Cornerstone. We are thrilled that you're here and worshiping with us today. Hey, it is banner year weekend and it is Cornerstone's birthday. It is our birthday, right? Um, we're, We're not singing happy birthday though. Nobody likes that song. It's depressing every time it's sung, right? And no one ever, happy, it's always happy birthday. So we're not doing it. We're just skipping over, keeping everything happy. Uh, We are celebrating two years of renewed ministry here at Cornerstone. Uh, And what our belief is, what we believe, and we truly do believe this, is that every year is a banner year. Right, That as you follow Jesus, as you put your faith and your trust and your hope in him, every year is a banner year. Now, look, this is what was going to happen. We were going to have a lot of fun this afternoon, right? We were going to have our banner year block party, which is what we do as we celebrate our birthday. We, we have a special sermon that's geared towards that. But then we also celebrate outside and inflatables and music and, and food and all this fun stuff. Uh, but the weather didn't want to cooperate with us <laughs> like at all. Early in the week, we're like, oh, it'll change. We're, we're believing it'll change. As the week got on, it got worse and worse until Friday. We looked at the forecast on Friday for Sunday, and it said, kid you not, 92% chance, not of just rain, we were like, we could handle some rain, 92% chance of thunderstorms with gusty wind and medium to large size hail. So park your car in your garage tonight, all right? (laughs) Um, So we were like, yeah, we, we can't roll with that. We can't mess with that. So we postponed it. It's rescheduled for next weekend. So next weekend is when all that stuff's going to be going on outside. If you want to stay after our 11 o'clock service, we're going to be uh, partying it up outside. Uh, food, music, inflatables, games, um, sassy dog, right? They're, they're a local spot. They're going to be here. So make sure you're here for that. So this week we're celebrating banner year in spirit. Next week we're celebrating in hot dogs. Amen. Right. We're going to be so, cel- and, and next year or next week feel, feels like it's been a year. We will be celebrating in cool climate controlled auditorium next week because the part for our air conditioning unit We'll be in <laughs> to the glory of God, right? Like, oh my goodness. We do, this is fantastic. We have a fan set up over here because I was sweating like a sinner uh, during first service. So if we can get our photography team to get some good action shots of me while my hair is blowing in the wind while I'm preaching up here, that would be fantastic. <laughs> uh, man, I am, I'm eager to preach. I've been excited about this uh, sermon. So excited for Banner Year weekend. Today, if you're a note taker and you like to take notes, our sermon title for today is Build the Altar, Bring the Ark. We're going to say it together real quick. Repeat after me. Build the altar, Bring the ark. <laughs> One more time. We'll, we'll say it so we don't say it like we're singing happy birthday, right? Happy birthday. Build the altar. All right, here we go. <laughs> Build the altar. Bring the ark. There we go. There we go. What we're going to be doing is looking at our own personal history here at Cornerstone. Uh, uh, not just looking back, but looking ahead to our future because stories matter, right? Stories matter. Some of the things we talk about today, you're going to be like, yep, I've heard that before. Honestly, your stories, you cannot share them enough. You just can't. Not just our church stories, your own personal stories, your relationship stories, your marriage stories. You cannot share them enough. My dad's uh, birthday was just on August 9th. My dad's been in heaven for a few years now, but we celebrated it on August 9th. We um, uh, went out and we went to one of his favorite places to eat, ponchos and green. We went to go eat. Then we went back to my mom's house afterwards uh, and just shared stories, just talked about my dad and uh, who he is and the stuff we loved about him. So we talked about all the stuff we always do, how crazy he was, that whenever we would go on vacation anywhere, if we're in a hotel, he'd always come out uh, whenever we were little and be like, hey, who wants to catch my underwear? And like fling it around the room. And we reacted like someone had just thrown a live grenade into the room, like ducking under stuff. Um, he, he, He had his own little Christian curse words. He'd call people sow huggers. And buzzard bait, like if something didn't go his way, ah, buzzard bait, right? Um, He was a huge lover of Skyline Chili. As do we have any Skyline Chili lovers in the place? There is no middle ground there. You either love it or you despise it, right? I love it. We love it in our family. That's from my dad. And so we shared all these stories. We just sat around and talked for about an hour, just about things that we love about him. And guess what? Not a single new story came up. Not one. Every story that someone would start, you instantly like, oh, I know where this one's going. I know where this is going. And guess what? No one cared, (laughs) 
No one cared. We, we love that we had heard these stories before because there is a power when you share your stories, right? There, there's a power in our stories. It helps foster bonds. It helps facilitate gratitude in our life. All of our siblings, we all feel closer after that. We're, we're grateful for the time that we had with my dad and what a great person he was. And the same is true for us. As we recall our stories as a church family, it facilitates bonds and it, it fosters gratitude in our life. So that's what we're going to do today. We're going to work through scripture as we do it. Where we're going to start today is 1 Samuel chapter 7. If you have a Bible and you want to follow along, we're going to be in 1 Samuel chapter 7. We're not going to have the words on the screen this week, but if you don't have a Bible or an app, you can just follow along with me as I read. Let me give you just a little quick background as we hop into 1 Samuel, uh, what's happening in Scripture at this point. The uh, nation of Israel, God's chosen people, they are being led by a man named Samuel. He's a prophet. He speaks uh, for God. He's leading them. And this is a very uh, uh, pivotal time in Israel's history. They feel like God has abandoned them. They feel like God is nowhere to be found. Uh, He's not speaking with them. He's not talking with them. They feel alone. And that's where we pick up in 1 Samuel chapter 7, starting in verse 1. Now, there's some words coming up. Y'all are going to have to bear with me. It's been a while since I've been out of Bible school. So we'll we'll see if Pastor Jacob can pronounce these. And if so, you guys can give me a singing ovation, all right? (laughs) Here's here's what it says in 1 Samuel chapter 7. So the men of kirith Jerem came to get the ark of the Lord, the ark of of the covenant, the Ark of the Covenant, this thing that God's presence dwelt in. God actually said, hey, you build this Ark, my presence will dwell here. So they came to get the Ark of the Lord. They took it to the hillside home of Abinabad and ordained Eliezer, his son, to be in charge of it. So far, so good. I haven't slipped up yet. (laughs) Verse two, the Ark remained in kirith Jerem for a long time, 20 years in all. During that time, All of Israel mourned because it seemed that the Lord had abandoned them. Then Samuel, the prophet of God, the leader of Israel, then Samuel said to all the people of Israel, if you want to return to the Lord with all of your hearts, get rid of your foreign gods. Turn your hearts to the Lord and obey him alone. Then he will rescue you from the Philistines. The Philistines, this was this group. um, They were like Israel's arch nemesis. They were Michigan to Israel's Ohio State. You feel me? Like that's, that's what we have going on here. These two kingdoms that were warring with each other constantly throughout the pages of the Old Testament. And so Samuel's saying, hey, if you guys return to God, if you repent and you return to God, he will give you victory over the Philistines. Verse four, so the Israelites got rid of their images of their foreign gods and they worshiped only the Lord. Then Samuel told them, gather all of Israel to Mizpah and I will pray to the Lord for you. So they gathered at Mizpah and in a great ceremony, they drew water from a well and poured it out before the Lord. They also went without food all day. They fasted, the nation of Israel. They went without food all day and they confessed that they had sinned against the Lord. When the Philistine rulers heard that Israel had gathered at Mizpah, they mobilized their army and advanced. The Israelites were badly frightened when they learned that the Philistines were approaching. Don't stop pleading with the Lord our God to save us from the Philistines, they begged Samuel. So Samuel took a young lamb and he offered it to the Lord as a burnt offering. He pleaded with the Lord to help Israel. Now something as as I'm reading this, something that stands out to me is... uh, how the nation of Israel is preparing for battle, right? This, this enemy nation, the Philistines, they're coming. They're coming towards them. And, and how the nation of Israel, did you guys catch how they were preparing? They weren't. Like they weren't preparing like at all. In fact, you read through here and you're going, what, what are you doing? Like, <laughs> there's an enemy nation on your doorstep. They're advancing towards you. And let's see, what are you guys doing? You're fasting, you're not eating any food, like you're not carbo-loading before the big event that's about to come up, like you're not getting protein, you're not eating, you're, you're fasting all day, you're repenting, you're offering burnt sacrifices, you're, what are you doing? Like what in the world are you doing? It seems like they're crazy in this moment. You have an enemy nation knocking on your doorstep and you are doing nothing to prepare for it. In fact, if you're looking at this, you're going, okay, Samuel, Yeah, clearly their leader is a prophet. He's a pastor. He's not a general because this dude has no idea what he's up to. He's not preparing his people at all 
for the pain that's about to hit them. They should be grabbing swords, not repenting. They should be making sure that they are capable of making war and defending themselves rather than praying and offering a sacrifice. What in the world are they doing? But you see, Samuel and Israel knew something. In this moment, they realized, you know what? If we want God to move mightily in our life, we need to prioritize our character over our capability. That's where we're going to invest. That's where we're going to spend our time. That's what we're going to focus on. Not our capability. We, we hear opposition is coming. We're, we're not worried about finding swords and getting geared up. No, 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 no. We're not focusing on our capability. We're going to focus on our character. Because we realize, you know what? On our own, we're not going to be able to defeat this enemy anyways. We need God's help. We need God to be fighting on our behalf. So we are going to prioritize character over capability. Again, it doesn't look like they know what they're doing, does it? It doesn't look like they know what in the world to do here. And it looks like they're crazy unless they're not. (laughs) Unless they do know what they're doing. Unless they do know what they're up to. Um, So high school football's back, right? Everyone excited for high school football? Friday Night Lights, I love it. Um, This past Friday, I got to go to the Maslin game. Maslin Tigers played Cincinnati Moeller. Uh, Me, Pastor Donnie, and uh, Jordan, uh, his wife, we we all got to go. We had a a blast. It was a really great time. Really good game. Um, One thing that I love about football is it brings out the crazy in everybody. Like, it just brings out the crazy. As we're pulling up, we're waiting in line, and we're, like, sitting here, and over here, there's an orange Jeep that's obviously... Like a Maslin Jeep, there's an orange Jeep just chilling over here, uh, and a guy gets out, he's got orange, like, uh, pit viper sunglasses, got orange pit viper sunglasses, the guy's probably, like, in his mid-50s, gets out, he's got the sunglasses, a full-on tracksuit that is, like, construction orange, and it's got tiger stripes all over it. The guy gets out with the sunglasses on, is just kind of strolling around, and I look over, I'm like, this dude's ready. Like, this dude's about to be screaming his head off as soon as we go in there. Then you go inside, and there's people painted up without shirts on, just nuts, and they're older dudes. And the thing that always kills me whenever I see this, whenever I see, like, not, not the young kids, not the teenagers or anything, but, like, the people who are in their 30s and 40s and 50s, like, that guy in that track suit, that's probably somebody's tax accountant, like, just chilling over there. That, that nut job in the front row yelling to teenagers, break his arm, break it. Like, that's someone's pediatrician. Like, I love, I love realizing that, that that's what's going on out in the, uh, the stands. <laughs> But man, it was, it was a, if you've never been to a Mass and Tigers game, get yourself to a Mass and Tigers game. It was wild. There was like 16 or uh, 12,000 people there. It was wild. Um, but the, the thing that was, it was a really good game, but the thing is, it wasn't the best game that happened this week. I don't know if anybody saw this online. It's been going viral. There was a high school football game in Georgia uh, on Friday night where a team won in fourth overtime. And this is how they won, all right? This is bonkers. If you haven't seen it, do yourself a favor, go on Google, Google Georgia High School overtime win. Um, you know, they're, they're playing, trying to get into the end zone, trying to, if they, if they score a touchdown, game's over. It's a walk-off. So quarterback receives the snap. The tight end, rather than running downfield, heading towards the end zone where you need to go, the tight end turns and runs t- towards the quarterback. The second this play starts, you're going, what are they doing? Like this, <laughs> like this looks ridiculous. Are they crazy? What, what in the world's going on here? The tight end runs towards the quarterback. The quarterback kind of like laterals the ball to him, to the tight end, the tight end. The tight end grabs the ball. The quarterback runs to the side. The tight end, I kid you not, goes to where the quarterback was standing, turns his back to the end zone and just flips the ball over his head. No look. As he's doing it, you're going, what are you doing? And then you look and see a wide open wide receiver right where the ball's about to land. Dude catches it in the end zone. The place goes nuts. I've never seen anything like this before. And as you're watching this play develop, you're thinking, like, this is it? This is the best you could draw up? It's just like a, hey, there we go. <laughs> like a shot that I would do in horse out in the driveway. Like it looks crazy until the kid caught it. It looked crazy up until that moment. Then you realize, oh, well, look crazy to me. They've probably practiced this a couple hundred times. Like they've been waiting for this moment. They've had this play. They've had this thing prepared. Everyone knows exactly where they're supposed to be. It looks crazy till it doesn't. Prioritizing your character over capability looks crazy until it doesn't. 
It looks nuts. What in the world are you doing, Israel? Why are you offering a sacrifice when your enemies are knocking at your door? Like, what, what are you doing worrying about repenting? You need to grab a sword. You need to run. You need to be doing something else. It looks crazy until it doesn't. We have got to prioritize character over capability if we want to see God move mightily in our life. And I am happy to say we have been doing that as a church. We have been doing this. We, man, we left our denomination. That's nuts. That's a scary thing to leave your denomination. That's a lot of ties. That's a lot of financial support. That, that's a lot of history. And we left our denomination. And in the process, guess what else we did? We gave up our old building. The building that we built. We, gef- we, we just left that thing, gave it up. They, we're going to take us to court. We're like, no, we're not taking other Christians to court. Absolutely not. So we gave up our old building. These things that at the time looked like, eh, we know what we're doing. <laughs> and then guess what? Rather than getting an immediate, hey, we knew what we were doing, we're thrust into two huge events. One, Pastor Charlie, one of the longest tenured pastors at Cornerstone and still a pivotal member of our church, passes away. Complete tragedy. No one knows what's going to happen. And then right after that, we're following it up by entering into a worldwide pandemic. And suddenly, the decisions that we made were like, what in the world were we thinking? This looks crazy. We're not capable of being able to do ministry now. Why weren't we focusing on our capability? You see, we weren't focusing on our capability. We willingly were deciding, nope, even if this makes us incapable of having ministry the way we've done it, that's all right because we're focusing on character. We will prioritize our character over our capability and trust the rest to God. That's what we did, and God has come through for us time and time and time again, amen? God has come through for us over and over again. When we prioritize character over capability, we will see God move mightily in our life. We have seen this as a church. We have seen God do this for us. And here's what's so beautiful about it. Whenever we do things like that, like whenever we left our denomination, whenever we gave up our building, whenever we do things like that, we don't do them, uh, we, we, we think it's like blind faith when we follow God, right? Like, oh, just take faith, just take faith. And we instinctively think that means It's just a wing and a prayer, I hope. Let me cross my fingers and hope that things work out. That is not what faith is. It's not blind faith. When we make decisions like that to prioritize character over capability, it's not blind faith that, well, hope God comes through. No, we we do that, we make that decision because of not blind faith, but because of lived experience. Because we have example after example after example of God coming through for us. So it's not blind faith. No, no, no. We've lived this out multiple times in our past and we have seen that God is good and God is faithful. So if he did it then, he'll do it again. It's not blind faith. It is lived experience. God has done it before. Absolutely. You should be clapping about that. Absolutely. You see, that's the thing. We we just talked about this our last two-part series. Um, that's, That's what our testimony is, right? Our testimony is our proof of God moving in our past. Our testimony is our proof. It's our evidence uh, of God working mightily in our life. And this is what I want to tell you. And it's what we're about to read here in scripture as we continue in 1 Samuel chapter 7. God has moved mighty in your life. He has. Some of us in this room, as I'm saying that, you're, I can see the amen, amen. People know like, yes, he has. I, I remember, I remember. But there's some people who you're like, yeah, I don't know. I can't remember. But God has moved mighty in your life even if you can't remember it. And this is what I want to tell you. This is so vital. This is so crucial. God can't fail, but your memory can. God will never fail you. Your memory will constantly fail you. You need to be building altars in your life. You need to be building altars. Listen to what it says in 1 Samuel as we continue. So the Philistines, they're, they're coming at Israel. They're about to uh, wipe them out, right? Israel hasn't been preparing at all. They don't have swords. They don't have anything on them at the moment. They're, they've been sacrificing. They've been repenting. They, they've been praying, doing all these things, but they're not ready for battle, so it seems. So Samuel makes this offering to the Lord. He pleads with the Lord to help Israel And the Lord answered him. Verse 10, just as Samuel was sacrificing the burnt offering, the Philistines arrived to attack Israel. 
But the Lord spoke with a mighty voice of thunder from heaven that day. And the Philistines were thrown into such confusion that the Israelites, the hungry, depleted, unprepared Israelites, defeated them. The men of Israel chased after them from Mizpah to a place below Beth Car, slaughtering them all along the way. Now listen to this, verse 12. This is what Samuel did. After God came through, after God worked a complete and utter miracle, the unprepared, not ready Israelites defeated the prepared, completely capable Philistines. And this is what they did. Verse 12, Samuel then took a large stone and he placed it between the towns of Mizpah and Jeshunah. He named it Ebenezer, which means stone of help. And he said, thus far, the Lord has helped us. Thus far, the Lord has helped us. Samuel and Israel built an altar. Tell your neighbor, build an altar. Build an altar. Build an altar. Put it in the chat online. Build an altar. Write this stuff down. If you, if you journal, journal. If you post on Facebook, man, post about God's faithfulness on Facebook. If you're more of a post-its person, write it on a post-it. Put it on your mirror. Put it on your dashboard. Do whatever you need to do to remember when God has been faithful because he has. Do what you need to do to remember. Build the altar in your life because your, your memory, it's going to fail you. It's going to let you down. And you're going to find yourself facing opposition, wondering, God, when have you ever done anything for me? When have you ever come through for me? You need to build altars in your life. My oldest daughter, Eden, she's getting her own room. She's, she is thrilled. Like her and her, and her uh, younger sister, Evelyn, she's six. Eden's eight. Um, they've shared rooms their whole life. Like the second Evelyn was born, they've been sharing a room and now they're getting ready not to. And it's very emotional for everybody but Eden. Eden is psyched out of her mind. She's like running around the room clapping and praise hands and hallelujah. She's, she's recording this. She can't wait. Evelyn, her younger sister, on the other hand, says it's the worst thing to ever happen ever. That's what she said. This is the worst thing to ever happen ever. Eden's psyched though because they are, they love each other so much, but they're very different personalities. Evelyn's very just kind of like devil may care, messy, just kind of all over the place, very energetic. Eden is very like, no, here are my things. It's just so. So Eden has been ready for her own room. Um, and so last night, last night was their last night in the same room together, like in, in their room. And so it was emotional, right? We, we prayed with them and stuff and said, thank, uh, thank God for the memories. Um, and one thing that I do, I keep a note in my phone of like just things that I don't want to forget because I will forget, right? Um, so I keep things. And so we've, we've, over the years, we've kept little records of conversations they've had, of fights that they've had. <laughs> of, we have like a little nanny cam in there and Jessica uh, has recorded like videos of them whenever we catch them like snuggling at night and it's adorable. They're like all cuddled up next to each other, holding each other. So we've recorded those and Jessica saved those videos. And um, we, we do all those things. The reason we do these things is because in this moment, as we're living this out, it feels like there's no way we could forget that. How in the world could we forget that? We, we would never forget that till we forget it. Till we forget it. Uh, Eden, whenever she was younger, she loved the uh, movie uh, Beauty and the Beast. Loved it. She always called it the beef. Beauty and the beef. <laughs> and I, I thought it was the cutest little thing in the world. And so I recorded it in my notes. It's one of those things I thought I would never forget. Completely and utterly forgot about it. Until every time I open up that note to add something else in and I see it and I re-remember and I'm like, oh, I'm so glad I recorded that. Because your memory fails you. Even on big things, things that you're like, oh no, never, no. Did you know that a lot of us, like, I guarantee the whole room, let me, okay. Um, how many people remember where you were when 9-11 happened? Shoot up your hand. If you're online, shoot up your hand. Okay, and you probably do. I'm not saying that you don't. But let me tell you, you probably think you remember that day way better than you actually do, right? You're like, no, no, no. I remember where I was, what I was wearing. I remember how I felt in the moment. Like I remember everything. They have done studies that show they've used pivotal moments like this where people are like, no, I can remember, I can remember to test people's memory. It's shocking how little we actually remember in detail. Uh, Malcolm Gladwell, he's a best-selling author and thinker. Uh, he did some research on this, both professional and just personal anecdotal um, interviewing people. Because guess what? He lived in New York City at the time of the attack. Like he lived there. He was blocks away from it. Him and some of his friends. And he went back, recorded his experience, the experience that he thought, oh, I know exactly how it went down. He recorded it. 
And he matched it up against some of his friends that he interacted with that day. The accounts are all over the place. None of them mesh up. Some of them are saying, I remember we all met up in the laundry room of the apartment complex. And the other one says, no, we met in the park just outside. And the other one say, no, no, no. Remember it was, we, we all met up on the rooftop balcony. Remember that? Like they can't remember just about anything. And that's with one of the biggest, most pivotal moments in our collective history of the last however many decades. And they lived in the city it happened. And they, yeah, can't really remember. Don't kid yourself. God's faithfulness, faithfulness in your life, your memory will fail you. And you will find yourself in the middle of moments wondering why God has never come through for you when he has. Build the altar. Do whatever you need to do to remember God's faithfulness in your life. We do that here at Cornerstone the best that we can. We try to do things to remember. We, at our old facility, we, we kept it whenever we left. Um, we had a stained glass window that we put in to commemorate a lady in our church who was a key uh, lady in our church, Tracy Kleibscheidel, who passed away uh, with cancer. Uh, we had a, a stained glass window because her faith was so strong during her, her testimony, her witness was so incredible. Uh, we had a commemorative stained glass window put up that had the lyrics to uh, her favorite song, Because He Lives, I Can Face Tomorrow. And that was an altar remembering, you know what? This is what faithfulness in God looks like. This is what it looks like to truly remember and to trust in God. And we do the same thing now. Just uh, a little over a year ago, we celebrate, not even a year ago, we celebrated our ministry partner Lifetime Achievement Award, right? And we gave it to Ron and Cheryl Roundtree, two incredible people in our church family. Since then, Ron has gone on to heaven. But in that moment, we are building an altar to show, man, this is what it looks like whenever people faithfully serve whenever they faithfully give themselves to Jesus's church. We build altars so we can remember what God has done in our life, in our church, through our people. Because if we don't, we'll forget. We'll forget. And when those hard times come, we won't get through them the same way that we would if we would have built the altar. Build the altar. It helps when the hard times come. It helps build confidence in us as we step into the future. But this is what I'll say. Altars are great. Altars are awesome. You want to build an altar to remember what God has done in your past. Altars are a great place to visit, but you don't want to live there. (laughs) They're a great place to visit, but you do not want to live at the altar. That's because God's provision is in your past the way he's provided for you, the way he's come through for you. God's provision is in your past, but God's presence is in your future. God is pulling you forward. God does not want you to remain stagnant in the promises that he kept years ago and to just live there. And yep, I'm, I'm never taking a step of faith again. I'm never walking out in faith and hope again. I'm just gonna stay right here where it's nice and comfortable. That one time when God came through for me, I'm, I'm never moving forward from this place. No, God wants you to step in to the future following his presence. He wants you to bring the ark, bring the ark forward. I want to read to us now. This is from uh, the book of Joshua, Joshua chapter three. Joshua was a a leader uh, in the nation of Israel. This is before Samuel's time. Uh, He's the first leader to take over after Moses. Moses passes away and God raises up Joshua and says, hey, you're going to be the next leader of my people. You're going to be the one that leads them in to the promised land, the land of Canaan. So Joshua starts doing that. He, he embarks to take God's people into the promised land. There's just one thing. There's a gigantic river standing in the way, the Jordan River. There's this massive river that they have to cross to even get into the promised land. And so this is what it says in Joshua chapter three. Early the next morning, Joshua and all the Israelites left Acacia Grove and they arrived at the banks of the Jordan River where they camped before crossing. Three days later, the Israelite officers went through the camp giving these instructions to the people. Now listen to these instructions. When you see the Levitical priests carrying the Ark of the Covenant, again, the symbol, this, this symbol that represents God's presence, When you see the priests carrying God's presence forward, move out from your positions and follow them. When you see God's presence on the move, move. (laughs) When you see God's presence going out forward in front of you, leave, move. Now, we we don't think much of this, but the place where they were camped out, Acacia Grove, uh, Acacia Grove, this area where they were, the Israelites weren't just there for like a couple nights. They were there for a very long time. 
If you read scripture and you study scripture, you see they were camped out here for a long, long time. And not just that, some pretty big pivotal moments in Israel's history happened in this area, this Acacia Grove area. Some of the things like uh, uh, the, the big, the great census that they took of all the people in the nation of Israel that we can read about in the book of Numbers, it took place in Acacia Grove. A huge battle where God came through for the Israelites as they defeated the, uh, the nation of Midian. This took place in Acacia Grove. Get this, Moses, his farewell speech, right before he would pass away, the greatest leader that Israel had ever known, this man who helped through God's power take them out of the land of Egypt, Moses gave his farewell address at Acacia Grove. You know how hard it would be to leave this place? <laughs> It would be hard for them to leave if if nothing of of consequence had happened there just because they'd been there a long time. But you have all these huge defining events for the nation. It had to feel comfortable and it had to be hard for them to leave. But guess what? God was calling them out. He was calling them saying, hey, look, I know I've provided for you. I know I've come through for you, but you need to leave and you need to trust that I'll do it again. You need to leave and you need to move. That is hard for us to do, to leave when something is comfortable, to leave when we're sitting in God's provision, right? That's hard. I've shared this story before. Me and my wife, uh, whenever we moved to Cleveland to try to start a church up there, uh, that was hard. We didn't want to do it for a long time. Like it, it was a, it was a difficult decision. One we prayed about over and over again, because things were good here. Like I worked at Cornerstone. I, I was, I was fine here. We live close to family. We didn't want to leave, but God was calling us. God was calling us out. And now hindsight, looking back, we realize, you know what? That was scary to leave God's provision and to go into the unknown. But if we could believe that God's presence was going before us, that the ark, that God's presence was truly going before us, then we can know even though we're scared, even though it's uncertain, God's going to come through because he's done it before. (laughs) We're, We're sitting in and living in the fact that God's come through for us. So why would we suddenly doubt that he's going to do it again? And sure enough, Whenever we moved, man, God did stuff to us. He changed us in so many ways. He, he changed me. He changed Jessica. He changed our family. He changed our faith walk. We, we came back from Cleveland completely different people than we were when we went up there. Completely different. We wouldn't change a thing because God called us out, trusted in him, and guess what? He came through just like he always does. And here's the thing, Cornerstone. God is going to continually call us as a church out. He's going to continually call us forward. That's why our new tagline is come and see, not stay and see. (laughs) Like you're not coming and then just like, oh yeah, let's just stay right here. We like how things are right now. No, 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 no. We're come, come along because we're on the move. Like we are moving forward where we feel God is calling us to be. Uh, And that's a scary thing, but we've done it before. And we're going to keep doing it. We did it whenever we were at uh, at Coventry Elementary School. That was a scary thing to move from there to here. Because there, even though things weren't perfect, man, it's rent. Like at any moment we can be out of there and we're fine. No fault. Like we don't got to, we don't got to worry about the air conditioning. (laughs) Like we don't got to worry about it. They have to take care of that. That's not on us, right? We don't, we don't have to worry about a mortgage. Now we do. Like those are Amen, if you know that a mortgage is scary, right? Like, those are, those are scary things. Those are trying things. Those are uncertain things. And wow, what if this happens? What if that happens? That was a very big step of faith for us to leave the comfort of Coventry Elementary School and move into an old, smaller building. It's a big step of faith, a very big step of faith to leave the comfortable and come here. But we saw God on the move and we thought, you know what? We need to follow the ark. (laughs) We need to bring the ark. We're we're on the move. We are bringing God's presence with us because we see him moving. We see him moving and he has come through for us before and we believe he's gonna come through for us again. We believe he's gonna do it. And here's why you have to believe that. Here's why you have to have faith in that. And this is so important. Make sure you're really tuned in on this. The reason, the reason faith is so important when you take that step is because God does not always make his presence known in the next step. You have to take it first. 
which we hate, don't we? <laughs> like we, we want the very clear sign that God's like, do this and it will work out. Like, okay, now I'll take the step. Thank you, God, for like uh, just taking away every fear, every doubt by just letting me know it's gonna work out exactly how I hope it would. That's not how things always work. We may not see God's presence until we make a move first. In fact, most moves of God start with a move from his people. Most moves of God that we can see, of course God is working behind the scenes. Of course God is doing things and he's, he's bringing up situations and he's giving us influence. But man, we don't know that. We can't see that. From what we can see, God wants us to make a move before he will make his move. Let me show you what I mean. Let's continue in Joshua chapter three. So Joshua's telling the people, hey, when the priests grab the ark, when they take off, make sure you leave with them. Since you've never traveled this way before, this is verse four, they will guide you. Stay about a half mile behind them, keeping a clear distance between you and the ark. And then Joshua told all the people, go and purify yourselves for tomorrow the Lord will do great wonders among you. In the morning, Joshua said to the priests, lift, lift up the Ark of the Covenant and lead the people across the river. And so they started out and went ahead of the people. The priests carried the Ark of the Lord and as soon as their feet will touch the water, the flow of water will be cut off upstream and the river will stand up like a wall. So Joshua's telling everybody, hey, look, this is what God's saying. If we move, if we take off, if we move and we start going, when we get to the Jordan River, the second the priests start stepping into the water, into that rushing current, once they step into it, God is going to move and do something great on our behalf. Verse 14, so the people left their camp to cross the Jordan. And the priests who were carrying the Ark of the Covenant went ahead of them. Now listen to this. It was the harvest season and the Jordan was overflowing its banks. So the Jordan River is already a powerful river, but it's harvest season. It's the strongest it's going to be all year. Not only is the river coursing, it is overflowing its banks. But as soon as the feet of the priests who were carrying the ark touched the water at the river's edge, the water above that point began backing up at a great distance away. And the water below that point flowed to the Dead Sea until the river, riverbed was dry. But if you notice, the Jordan didn't stop flowing. The Jordan didn't start to dry up until the priests stepped into the river. It didn't start to, they didn't come up to it and be like, all right, God, your move. <laughs> you, you move, then we'll move, God. You do a miracle, then we'll move, God. You show us that we have to have no faith at all. You just do everything, then we'll step forward. No, 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 no. God says, I want you to step before the river dries up. I want you to put your faith and your trust in me. The water is still rushing. The water is still coursing when they take their first step. Step. God says, look, I want you to move now and worry about miracles later. I just want you to move. I want you to be faithful now and worry about fruit later. I want you to have the faith. Cornerstone, for us, what that looked like, I want you to have the faith for you to step out of the comfortable being at Coventry. I want you to step out from that into the unknown of buying this facility, buying a facility that you know is too small, that you know you're going to need to work on. I want you to take that step of faith. Not only that, I want you to take the step of faith to start a giving campaign in the middle of inflation and a recession and a pandemic. <laughs> I, want you, I want you to start having a giving campaign during all that going on. I want you to take that first step of faith. And we have. We are, we're, this is incredible. It's just a little over a year that we've been doing our giving campaign. We're closing in on $500,000 raised. That's monumental. That's insanity. That's amazing. We're, we're seeing fruit happen. We're, we're seeing lives change. We're seeing so many things happen. And we're believing that this is just the tip of it. This is just the tip of the iceberg. There is so much more coming that God is going to do. We believe that we are going to have a great facility here, a facility that people are able to come and see, to come and experience Jesus. And this is what I'll say, because I get it. I get it. Like, don't think that because we're staff and I'm the pastor that I don't understand. We're going to have a facility that you are going to be like ecstatic to invite somebody to. Like, <laughs> I get it, right? You don't, you don't want a facility where you're like, 
yeah, come, uh, but bring your own fan. <laughs> come, but maybe wear like a short sleeve t-shirt and like shorts or something because it's going to be hot because the AC is kind of on the fritz and, you know, the lights may flicker at some point. And this speaker, it's kind of weird. We kick it every now and then and it kicks back in. But, you know, like we don't want you to have to do that. <laughs> and we're believing as we continue raising, as we continue trusting on God, that's the fruit we're going to see that people who may have never given Cornerstone a chance because we are unique. We're not better than any other church, but man, we'd be kidding ourselves if we didn't admit there's something different happening here. We have a very unique culture, a very unique DNA here at Cornerstone, and we want people to be able to experience that and be able to want to give us a try without driving by and be like, eh, looks a little bit, uh, I don't know. Let's try somewhere else. <laughs> let's get out of here. Let's go, let's go try something else. And we're believing that fruit is coming. We believe that's happening as we continue to trust in God. Trust that his presence is walking into our future, and so we will take that step with him, step by step, fueled with confidence. Again, not blind faith. We're not stepping with blind faith. We're stepping because of lived experience, and we can be confident. We can be confident, and here's what I'll say. We need to be confident as we take those next steps. We need confidence, and this is why. I want you to really pay attention to this. It's just one little sliver at the end of Joshua chapter 3 that we're reading from today. Listen to what it says. So they cross over this big obstacle, this big opposition. They're, they're trying to go into the promised land, and there's this raging river in between them and the promised land, and it's, it's huge, but guess what? God does this incredible miracle. He dries up the river. They're able to cross, but listen to this tiny little part of the end of verse 18, listen to what it says, or the end of verse 17. Meanwhile, the priests who were carrying the Ark of the Lord's Covenant stood on dry ground in the middle of the riverbed as the people passed by. They waited there until the whole nation of Israel had crossed the Jordan on dry ground. Then all the people crossed over. Listen to where they crossed over. This is, this is huge. The people crossed over near the town of Jericho. Who knows something about Jericho? All my OG Sunday school people. You're like, oh yeah, the walls of Jericho, right? Why that's so pivotal, why that's so important is because they had just crossed over through opposition and hardship and a lot of faith and a lot of trust in God. And guess what was waiting on the other side of the river? Jericho. More opposition. More things to have to put faith and trust in God and more opportunities to go, oh, I don't know. I don't know if God's going to come through for us again. Can I tell you, there is always a Jericho in your life. Always. I don't care what you're in the middle of right now, what you just got through, something else is coming. Aren't you feeling encouraged right now? <laughs> right? Something else is always coming. There is always a Jericho. But here's what I'll tell you. The opposition of Jericho is really an opportunity. It's an opportunity to trust in God and when he sees you through, like you know he will, an opportunity to thank God, to, to, to praise him, to build another altar because of his faithfulness again. There's always another Jericho. There just is. Um, uh, in our last little few minutes together, I shared earlier this uh, year in our permission slip series how I used to be terrified of roller coasters, right? just petrified of them. I, I was so scared of roller coasters. I started to conquer my fear, but the fear that I conquered wasn't like a one and done fear. Like I rode one coaster and boom, I'm done. Like, yeah, I rode the Snoopy Express. What now? Like, I'm good. Like, I'm good. You put me on anything and I'm fine. That's not how it worked. <laughs> like I rode like corkscrew. I'm like, whoo, wow, that was wild. Then I rode Iron Dragon. I'm like, whoo, all right. This, this is pretty crazy. And then, like, you just realize the coasters are all different. <laughs> like, it's not like one coaster is just it and then you're done. There's always another, and there's, like, something different with the next one, right? So, like, you, you, ride, you ride Iron Dragon, like, yeah, now we need to go ride the Raptor. You, like, you hang on that one. Um, you, you do what now? You hang? Like, no, no, I sit in roller coasters. I don't know about you. I don't hang in roller coasters. I sit in roller coasters. It's like, no, 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 you hang down. So you do that one, and you're like, whoo, okay. Like, I've, now I've conquered it. I've conquered all roller coasters. Like, yeah, now it's going gatekeeper. You hang off the side of it. 
you what? You hang, how is that, is that possible? You hang off the side of it, and then you go and you see Millennium Force, and you see Steel Vengeance, and these ones, like the hill that you go down isn't like a hill. It's like an inverted hill. It like scoops in before it goes back out. There's always something else. There's always some bigger coaster, some crazier coaster, some faster coaster. So your fear isn't just extinguished once, and then you're just good. There's always another Jericho. There's always another coaster. There's always something else. And what I want to tell you, for us as a church, there's going to be something else. Right now, it's a busted AC unit that has us all sweating like crazy in here. That's our problem. Our problem is a building that just looks dated and it's kind of like, uh, in a parking lot that you might break an ankle if you wear high heels walking across in it, right? Like that's, that's our problem right now. But can I tell you, one of these days, we're going to be killing for these kind of problems, because if we keep on the trajectory that I believe we are headed towards, once this, once this building is renovated and we start working on it and it's looking great, we're, we're going to be experiencing way more growth than we've even had already. We have a lot of people. And with a lot of people come a lot of more issues. <laughs> are we going to be ready for that? Are people going to come and actually feel like, hey, I was able to come and see Jesus and people actually saw me, like I didn't fall through the cracks? Because we're able to handle that now. Will we be able to handle that whenever we have more people? Whenever we add maybe another service, will we be able to handle that? To be able to handle that, we need more ministry partners. Are we going to be able to have more ministry partners? Will people sign up? There are problems coming our way because there's always a Jericho. There's always something. There's always another opposition, and it's another opportunity for you to waver, to, oh, I don't know. God, I know you've come through before, but this time feels so different. This time feels so scary. This time feels so unknown. But man, as you continue just trusting in God, as you continue to build the altar so you do not forget his faithfulness, it doesn't matter what comes your way. You are so much more likely to say, you know what? Yes, this is scary. Yes, this does feel different. Yes, this is a big unknown. But every other time I've ever felt that way, God's come through. I have the testimony to prove it. I have, I have the altar to prove it that every other time he's come through, so why would this time be any different? And that right there, church, that is how you have not just banner year after banner year, that's how you have banner day after banner day because your glory days are, are never behind you. They're always in front of you, always in front of you. That's, and, and they're right now. That's why you hear a lot of people, yeah, the best is yet to come. No, and the best is today. The best is right now. God is doing something incredible right now. And whenever you have that kind of mindset of building altars and bringing the ark, the presence of God with you, you can truly live that way and truly believe it. That the best days aren't just ahead, but they're here and now. And that every day can be a banner day. Let me pray with you real quick, all right? Heavenly Father, we are so thankful for who you are, that you are a powerful God a God who does incredible things on our behalf. God, we have so many testimonies in this room, so many testimonies online of ways that you have come through for us time and time again, even times we don't know about. The the altars that we will never be able to build because you came through for us and we never even knew about it. God, you're just that good. You're just that amazing. You're just that loving. You're just that kind. But God, for the altars that we should be building, the ones that we do know about, help us to do that. Help us to to take a moment to pause and reflect when we know that you've come through for us and to record it, to do whatever we need to do to make sure that our memory does not fail us when it comes to your faithfulness. We want to remember, not just so that we can thank you, but so that we can trust you as we take steps forward, that we can know no matter what comes our way in the future, we have a God who has won battles in the past and he'll win battles in our present and in our future if we just trust that his presence is with us. Help us to do that through the power of your spirit, Father. We ask all of this in your mighty and your powerful name. Amen.